as Bitcoin becomes integrated into Wall Street, uh, Bitcoin has to shed its ethos, as he called it. Essentially, it has to stop being a tool of of dissent, a a, a threat to both commercial and central banks, and essentially become their tool. Basically, if Bitcoin is kept in that box that people like Larry Fink and Jeffrey Epstein and people like them, Larry Summers, presumably, who was on the Zappo advisory board, um, you know, these guys want Bitcoin to be a specific thing because they can use it. And there's people in this space, like this RSK guy, saying Bitcoin needs to lose its revolutionary ethos. It's got to drop that and become a tool for Wall Street. I think it's pretty obvious what needs to be done to scuttle those plans, which would be uh, ensure the opposite. While many experts have been completely bullish as they anticipate the rewards for crypto summer, investigative journalist and researcher Whitney Webb focuses on a different and much darker perspective. In her latest interview, Whitney reveals her recent observations and findings on intentions towards Bitcoin by certain people in power. She highlights the desires of individuals like Larry Fink and Jeffrey Epstein, and figures like Summers, who seek to mold Bitcoin into a specific utility that aligns with their objectives. She contends that the emphasis placed on Bitcoin as a store of value, particularly by figures like Michael Saylor, and the prevailing belief in Bitcoin's perpetual rise, is masking its genuine worth. Bitcoin's essence lies in its permissionless interaction between two entities. Whitney cautions against allowing banks and Wall Street to exclusively label Bitcoin as a store of value, as this aligns with their agenda and perpetuates a narrative that serves their interests. Let us now view clips of Whitney Webb as she elaborates on this eye-opening information. As we show you these clips, we encourage you to show your support by giving us a like, subscribing to the channel, and turning on post notifications to stay updated with similar content. Make sure to stay until the end of the video, where Whitney Webb exposes the dark realities behind the current state of Bitcoin. Thanks and enjoy. So one of these figures that, you know, that comes up a lot in the piece, this uh, Diego uh, Gutierrez, uh, he's one of the co-founders of RSK, of Rootstock. Um, He gave this very revealing interview about a year ago, and he was talking about several things that I think are important to bring up in the context of this interview. One of them is that as Bitcoin becomes integrated into Wall Street, uh, Bitcoin has to shed its ethos, as he called it. Essentially, it has to stop being a tool of of dissent, a, a threat to both commercial and central banks, and essentially become their tool. That's what he says. Um, so for Bitcoin to succeed, in his eyes, that has to happen. So that's very uh, telling. And then he also says that there's going to be a concerted push uh, to move away from money printed by the state, meaning central banks, uh, and instead move to commodity-backed stable coins where the people that own the commodities will have all the power. We're likely going to get set up for something like that, where they're going to try and make like existing money worthless. And if you want your money to be worth anything and maintain any sort of semblance of purchasing power, you have to use uh, financial products X, Y, and Z. And they're all yeah. going to be programmable and surveillable, if not by the private sector, by the public sector. And they're going all going to be interoperable. They're going to be all these um, all these different wallets and digital ID systems that look like they're different companies, but they're all the same, uh, essentially, in terms that they can export all their data to the same central global database. And, you know, that's essentially the goal here. So how do we fight against that? Don't use the database. Don't use the digital wallet. Don't use the digital ID. Don't interact with the system. And I think also, you know, I think Bitcoin is is obviously very key to their plans, but they need Bitcoin to stay, as Larry Fink said, a technology for asset storage. They refuse to have it be a currency. And actually, Jeffrey Epstein gave an interview about Bitcoin that I didn't know about until maybe like a couple months ago when we started researching this. Oh, yes. No and idea. he says the exact Part same two. thing Larry Fink says. It's yeah, it's not a currency. It's you know a technology for asset store. Basically, if Bitcoin is kept in that box that people like Larry Fink and Jeffrey Epstein and people like them, Larry Summers presumably, who was on the Zappo advisory board, um, you know these guys want Bitcoin to be a specific thing because they can use it. 
And there's people in the space, like this RSK guy, saying Bitcoin needs to lose its revolutionary ethos. It's got to drop that and become a tool for Wall Street. I think it's pretty obvious what needs to be done to scuttle those plans, which would be uh, ensure the opposite. So people need to be putting resources into making that happen. Basically, to, to recap on that, if they need the Bitcoin blockchain for asset storage, and presumably if we're right about what's going on in this article, which we seem to be, carbon markets, they need that blockchain. How do we make invert their plans and use the Bitcoin blockchain so that it's a the tool of financial freedom it was heralded to be? Because they can't get rid of it without scuttling their own plans. Now, just a quick news intermission before we proceed with more of Whitney Webb's eye-opening insights. A recent report by Ecoinometrics observes the impact that the spot Bitcoin ETFs have had in driving Bitcoin's growth. These ETFs accumulated 200,000 BTC from January to mid-March, coinciding with Bitcoin's surge from $40,000 to $75,000. Recently, the inflow into the ETFs has slowed down, and a stagnation in Bitcoin's price movement followed. Econometric suggests that without ETF demand, Bitcoin's price appreciation cannot grow further. Despite that opinion, the report acknowledges Bitcoin's role as a hedge against currency debasement. Comparing Bitcoin Gold and the NASDAQ over the past decade, Bitcoin has outperformed significantly, showing a 44-fold increase in value. Let us now return to Whitney Webb as she further exposes the darker realities of bad intentions. A lot of that is because a lot of money and effort has been put into specifically homogenizing uh, media discourse in the Bitcoin space because they want them, they want Bitcoiners as much as possible to be compliant while Larry Fink and his ilk do what they want with Bitcoin and make it what they want it to be so that people are content with number grow up and sort of the sailor-esque talking points that have gotten a lot of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people have heard those versus what you just mentioned, from example, uh, you know, it, there needs to be a cultural shift in Bitcoin in the opposite direction of what this Diego guy from Rootstock said, where he's like, we need to drop the whole, you know, it, stop fiscal irresponsibility of the banks and central banks and, um, you know, be a challenge and threat to their power. We have to drop that if we want to get rich. I mean, that's the mentality there. And I feel like the sailor mentality really isn't that different from that. We have to push people in the other direction because if we go in the direction they're pushing those, you know, people to go in, you know, people that want to drop the ethos or whatever and make Bitcoin just a tool for Wall Street. Um, I mean, no, if, if we let that happen, very bad things happen and there has to be a fight and there's a specific effort that's been launched against people that hold Bitcoin to try and get them to be compliant in that sense. And, you know, and, but, and that's through, you know, controlling the discourse in the media space. There needs to be a desire among, among Bitcoiners to return to the original ethos, uh, not the opposite. There needs to be a fight for that. People need to care about that again. And so essentially, you know, we, we really can't get out of this if we, uh, unless we choose not to interact with the system and create something either parallel or just find some way to live your life without having to really interact with the, you know, the digital ID in the digital wallet at all. And it doesn't enable the fiscal irresponsibility of the commercial and central banks to you to, to dump all the irresponsible like debt generated by their money printing into like Bitcoin and be like, oh, problem solved. Keep printing forever. I mean, that's basically what they want to do. It's insane. It is. And there's people that are like, that's fine because now I have money. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. So you remember why you got into this? And like, you know, I don't know. And there's a lot of different ways it seems like it's coming together. You know, the World Bank is working with with Google and a lot of these other entities, including the ones in this article about Green Plus that are direct partners of Green Plus to create the climate wallet. That's tied up with the whole idea of doing CBDCs and, and all of that, right? 
uh, and things related wallet. to that, the private sector equivalent. They call it the climate wallet. Yeah, because it's all tied up with carbon emissions and there's this, you know, the carbon taxes and all of that. And this is why, you know, I, I would like to point out, we mentioned it a little bit earlier, but bring it up again, the whole idea of SpaceX being involved in launching these Green Plus satellites. Um, Elon Musk is a big proponent of carbon taxes and has been for a very long time. So there's this whole thing going on in carbon markets right now because everyone involved has been outed for being, you know, well, not everyone involved, but basically the whole market up until now has basically been outed as being very like grift prone, you know, lots of fraud, lots of negligence, et cetera, et cetera. And so generally what happens is, is that when the private sector wants something or they want They've created a big market for something. They've invested lots of money in creating something like the carbon market, and no one's using the carbon market. They are going to then use the public sector to force people to use the carbon market. And so they're trying to do that through the, un through the guise of climate emergency. So part of what we're talking about here, part of the way to like defeat this apparatus that Mark, as Mark referred to it, um, so much of what they do, including like their uh, media ops uh, in, in efforts to control discourse, but also just like getting people to onboard to stuff when they otherwise want it, it all runs on fear, right? And like all the stuff that happened during COVID, people fell in line because of fear. It's all fear-based, pretty much everything they do. A great way to not fall into that is not be afraid of these people no matter what psyop they throw at you and i think this year election year not just in the u.s but in much of the world uh yeah unprecedented fear-based psyops are going to be coming one after the other until they get enough people to comply and acquiesce and the way to uh you know get around that is to not fall into it you know, it's the trap and a lot of it is the media discourse. And I think, you know, the more controlled online discourse becomes, the greater the effort will be to use it to get people to be very afraid of what's happening. Yeah. And if you unplug a little bit and spend more time in like the actual world, you are much less likely to feel that way. And I think that's why during COVID, they wanted so much of our discourse to be online. And then they took even greater control of the online discourse. And we know now uh, under the guise of election censorship, they're going to clamp down even more on online discourse and lead it in very particular directions. They want Americans in particular to be at each other's throats. You know, textbook divide and conquer, among other things, though. I mean, they have this whole war on domestic terror apparatus, all this stuff about civil war, and we need this and that. Regular Americans are generally on the same side and they want to divide everyone and it's all through fear. And they've been doing this psyop after psyop after psyop, whether it's 9-11, COVID, you name it. I mean, it's all fear based and wants to alienate, alienate you from your local community. Like, again, it's about self-reliance at the local level. Uh, you know, that's a big part of the response, but it's also, you know, getting people, not just you yourself, though, obviously that's where you start, but making sure that the fear doesn't uh, anchor in to, you know, where you are based. I think that's a big part of it. Don't let them, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's so much stuff to say. I feel like I've already said it, just, I guess, repeating, uh, don't fall into the fear-based psyops. It's just, maybe we should get offline a little bit more everybody. And also, um, please do not let Bitcoin become Larry Fink's little bitch. I mean, that's just embarrassing. What are your thoughts on Whitney Webb's revelations regarding the intentions of certain individuals towards Bitcoin? And do you think there are other hidden agendas or intentions at play within the crypto space that we should be aware of? Share your thoughts in the comment section below. If you found some value in today's video, we would appreciate it if you hit that like and subscribe button. Lastly, if you would like to be updated with all of our future updates, please tick that notification bell. Your support encourages us to create more content on the latest relevant news in crypto. Thank you for watching. We hope to see you in our next video.